How's everyone doing today? Very good. All right. It is good to be here. Yes, it is. Today we're going to be talking about corruption. Uh, I couldn't come up with a really good title, so I just named it Corruption. <laughs> so, uh, turn with me, if you will, in uh, your Bibles to 2 Timothy 3.1. It says this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, again, to, for the opportunity to come into your house and to hear your word, Father. I pray that you open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Apostle Paul wanted to warn Timothy of the heresies in which he was going to, uh, that was going to be opposed to. Uh, and the word to him is also a word to us as well. Amen. He starts off, but he says, but know this. And it's important to listen to really what he's going to say next. That in the last days, perilous times will come. These, uh, that word perilous, it's, it, it's translated in other translations as terrible, distressing, grievous, hard, uh, stressful times that will come. In his previous letter, the Apostle Paul warned you know, Timothy about uh, the collapse of the predicted last days uh, and a term of which is really the entire period from Christ up to his return. Now, during this interim, according to the predictions, that the world is going to see these terrible uh, times of societal degradation. You know, so the Apostle Paul, he gives this uh, extraordinary list of 19 different general characteristics that believers should expect, right? He goes on in, in uh, verse uh, 2, he says, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and for such people turn away. So look what he says. He says people will be lovers of themselves. Uh, these are going to be selfish, self-centered, narcissistic, narcissistic people. Lovers of money, kind of sounds like our government, right? Uh, boastful. It's an outward manifestation that inwardly they are proud, right? They, it says that they are blasphemers. They are abusive to others. And the several words that come up next in the Greek, it, it has the prefix of ah, like uh, meaning without, like moral and amoral or theist and atheist. Uh, it signifies an absence of, this, uh, of the designated virtue. So thus... They are, he says they're disobedient to parents. They are unthankful, unholy, which pertains to, you know, being, being holy is what pertains to God. So he's saying basically people are not uh, consecrated or devoted to God. He goes unloving or really tr it could be translated heartless, unforgiving, which is pertaining to being unwilling to be reconciled to others unwilling to be at peace with others. Have you ever met anyone like that? Slanderers. And the, the Greek word there is dabios, which uh, is translated in other places as Satan, uh, which is kind of interesting that they use the word Satan for uh, slanderous. Without self-control, brutal, uh, despisers of good. It, it goes into the next two in the, the Greek a prefix that is pro. So there's traitors, and this is uh, someone that's disposed to be of uh, betrayal. Uh, headstrong, uh, someone that is reckless in their decisions. And then the final three are haughty, meaning puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It have, have any form of godliness which is an outward appearance of the reverence of God. Denying the power describes the religious activity that is not connected with living a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so as time progressed, people would become, uh, uh, you know, they, they'll begin to participate in religious things, but however, they will be empty of the substance. You know, you can, you, can, you can do a religious act and not really be into what you're doing, and that's kind of what he's saying. The activity has nothing to do with a true relationship with God uh, or an individual faith of being in Jesus Christ. Jesus addressed, you know, the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 25 through 26. Look what he says. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, cleanse the outside of the cup of, uh, and dish, but inside full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, and the, and the outside of them may be clean also. And so he's saying that basically that they were foolish in the sense that they would, they would be, take such care of cleaning the outside, uh, which is something that to, to simply be looked at, and leaving the inside dirty, which is something that they actually use. And so when they do that, they, they tend to uh, avoid these scandalous sins, you know, that, that would spoil their reputation, but they allow themselves in the heart for the wickedness to grow, and which really uh, results in uh, not having a pure relationship with God. And so... That's what Jesus was saying, that, you know, that it, the change has to come from the inside out. Amen? It has to come from the inside out. We can change the outward. We can make ourselves look better. We can be worried about our reputation amongst other people. But what's most important is what is on the inside. Back at 2 Timothy 3.5, he says, Having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. Having this form or an outward shape, this appearance of being godly, but inside they're not exactly what they appear to be. And who was he writing this to? He was writing this to believers. He was writing it to Timothy that he needed to be careful, right? He needed to be careful, you know, that here there's people that they have this appearance of being godly, but they weren't what they, they, they presented themselves to be. We know that the devil oftentimes comes as a, a, as a, sheep, you know, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. But he says that they deny the power, denying its power. What power are they denying? The power of God to work in their lives. The power of God to change their lives. Only when someone truly surrenders their life to the Lord Jesus Christ what they receive, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and He comes into our lives, and He begins to bring this change from the inside out. Amen. Now, Jesus says this concerning the Holy Spirit in John 16, 8 through 9, where He says, And when He comes, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in Me. So He here He says that this is what the, the Holy Spirit's job to do. Convict us of sin, which is something we shouldn't do. Convict us of righteousness is something that we ought to be doing. So not only does the Spirit convict us of what not to do, that isn't, all, that isn't His whole job, right? His job is to convict us of what we ought not do, but He also convicts us of what we should be doing. Because, you, you know, we typically replace behaviors. You never really quit doing anything. When someone's wanting to quit smoking or quit drinking, you know, I mean, you know, you, you usually replace those behaviors with other behaviors, right? Well, that's what the Spirit does in our life. He comes in, He convicts us of what not to do, then He convicts us of what we ought to be doing because, listen, if you're busy doing something good, you don't have time to do the bad, right? So that's what He does, and He convicts us of judgment knowing that the the ruler of this world is judged. And if the ruler of this world is judged, how many know that we too will stand in judgment one day? So you need to know that there is a difference between conviction and condemnation. And this is important because when you start talking about all of these, these lists, this whole list of 19 different things, I'll tell you, to, to, to be honest, I'm probably guilty, right, of every one of those at some point in my life. Right? None of us are without sin. 
So I want you to understand that there is a difference between conviction and condemnation. I remember when I first came to the Lord, uh, I, anytime, and I was really trying hard to live my life right, try to do the right thing, but let me tell you something, it was a whole, it was hard, you know, to come out of that lifestyle that I was in. And anytime that I would mess up, I would think to myself, you wicked servant, you wicked servant, those, those words kept, ringing in my head. And then one day, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and says, Michael, stop beating yourself up. And it was at that moment I realized that that wasn't God telling, calling me a wicked servant. That was me thinking that's what God would say to me in my moment of weakness. So, you know, conviction says, you know what? What you did is wrong. Come on, you can do better. Condemnation says, look what you did, you dirty sinner. So you need to understand that the Spirit doesn't come into our lives to condemn us, but He does come in our lives to convict us because we can do better. Amen. We can be better. Amen? So like I said, He convicts us. Most of these... Um, 19 characteristics are inward tra traits that manifest themselves outwardly, don't they? And though these characteristics are cataloged under this prediction about the last days, it's clear that the Apostle Paul considered them already present in Ephesus. You know, so he, he already he knew that they were there because that's why he sent this warning. Although human behavior hasn't changed a great deal, over time, the fact of the matter is these traits, he says, that they would intensify over time. So Timothy had to be aware of such people and to avoid them. And there's no doubt Paul in his mind here, you know, that Timothy's official association is what he had in mind but since he had already instructed Timothy to show kindness to everyone. If you look at 2 Timothy 2.24, and he says, the servant of the Lord uh, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. So as believers, we are to show kindness and love to everyone. However, there are those who outwardly proclaim to be believers, but inwardly they are not. And that, 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 that whatever's inwardly will oftentimes come out. And what the Apostle Paul was doing is he was instructing and saying, listen, you, you can't allow those people in your inner circle. You know, we are, to, we are to go out. There's a difference between those in the world who are not professing, because listen, Jesus sat and ate with sinners. Mm -hmm. And we are to be a light to the world. But you have to be careful about those who confess to be believers, but yet are not living that way. There is... There is because in, in 2 Timothy like 3, 5, where it says, have a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people, turn away. He's talking about those who have not and will not surrender to the Holy Spirit. They will not surrender their lives to the Lord. These are like the scribes and the Pharisees who are more concerned about appearances and not true discipleship. We are to show kindness and love to all, but we are to be careful about who we allow into our lives. We are to be careful. George Or Orwell uh, said, The mistake that you make, don't you see, is thinking that you can live in a corrupt society without being corrupt oneself. Right? That's the mistake a lot of people make. They think that they, you can live in this around a bunch of... How many people think that they can just live around a bunch of corruption and somehow it doesn't affect them? It doesn't affect them at all. But the fact of the matter is, it does. It says, you know, that, that this, this corruption, it happens... You know, well, I, I was reading uh, an article this morning, as a matter of fact, and in this article, it talked about the myths of corruption, Right? And in this article, it's saying that corruption happens quickly and not slowly, uh, as some, some recent studies show that, that corruption just happens all of a sudden and not, not like a slow progression. Which I kind of disagreed with it because I'm thinking... But they, they show, they said that they, they, in these new studies, uh, 
it says that they suggest given opportunity that people are likely to perform a corrupt act such as bribery if the opportunity arises abruptly. And that was their conclusion. Well, I would have to say that corruption was already in the heart. It was already in the heart. They just had opportunity. You know, you never know where you stand until you're tested. How many know that? You can say all you want. You never know where you stand until you're tested. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which he says is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to be not just hearers of the word of God, but we are to be doers as well. We are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable to God. How we live our lives is important. It is important. We are to present our bodies, as he says, as a living sacrifice. And what is a sacrifice? What is a sacrifice? It is something that we give up to God. And often to make, oftentimes it's to make an atonement for our sin. But there are other reasons related to the Mosaic Law that we are to give our lives up, that it is not ours anymore. The Bible teaches us that you are not your own, that you have been bought with a price. And we should live a life that brings glory unto our God. Amen. Not just one that's concerned about the outward or how we present ourselves to other people. You know, I, mean, I would be more concerned about what God thinks of me than what other people think of me. Amen? But we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and that means it starts inwardly with our minds. If our minds are renewed, then we're in a good position to prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God is. This means that we would admit to our own failures and seek to live a life uh, according to the Word of God and not our own ways. This means that we are to distance ourselves from those who live contrary to the Word of God. How many know it's much easier to put some, pull someone down than it is to lift somebody up? Sometimes we think, well, you know, I need to be around them because, you know, I can, I can bring them to the Lord. Sometimes, listen, oftentimes they'll be dragging you down more than you're lifting them up. Look what the Apostle, said, Apostle Paul says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 14-15. He says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Biel? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? I mean, you know, when you're yoked to something, right? You're tied to them. You're connected. And we are to go, we are to, like I said, we are to go into the world. And we are to be a witness to those in the world. Like I said, Jesus sat and he ate with sinners. Amen? But we're not to be too close. Amen? Look what he says here in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And what if you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, he says, come out from amongst them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are to come out from amongst the unbelievers. We are to go into the world, but we are not of this world. Amen. Amen. We are to go into the world to be a light to the world. There are those that come out, you know, and they confess with their lips that they are believers, yet their lives are contrary to the gospel. These people are self-deceived. If you don't separate yourself from them, they will have you believing that you can live any which way you want to and still be saved. They'll have you believe that. Many choose Jesus as Savior, but very few people choose Him as Lord. And I submit to you that you can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other. If He is not your Lord, He is not your Savior. You know, serving 
uh, the Lord is an active process. It's not a passive one. It isn't like it just happens to you. You have to pursue the Lord. Amen. And corruption, it's kind of like that proverbial frog, isn't it? The proverbial frog in the water. You know, that, that if you're in, in a, you know, you can't take a, a frog and put him in boiling water. What is he going to do? He's going to leap right out of that pot. But you can put a frog in cold water and slowly warm it up, and that frog will get accustomed to the heat, keep getting accustomed to the heat, and then just sit there and boil to death. That's the way corruption is. Oftentimes, if you sit in it long enough, you, they'll have you believing that this is the way that it's supposed to be. It's time for the church to wake up. It's time for the church to separate themselves from that. And like I say, you know, when, when you, it's important that we have to change the environment that we're in. We may have to change the environment we're in and the people that, that are around us. And it's important to seek the wisdom of the Holy Spirit because the greatest cause of corruption is that promotion of self. Let me ask you a question, okay? If someone were to offer you $1 million to lie for them, right? They, this person, say a person was accused of murder and they needed an alibi and they're willing to pay you $1 million, $1 million to just say a simple lie that, hey, I was with them that night during that time. Would you do it? You probably would at first go, yeah, I, I wouldn't take it. But then after a little while, you're thinking, it is a million dollars. It is a million dollars. And you know what? Think about it. I could tithe on that. <laughs> right? And that means that would be $100,000 Go into a charity. See, after a while, you'll start seeing the good in it. And when you start trying to see the good and evil, that's where the corruption will creep in. See, I don't agree with the studies that say that, all, that, 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 that corruption happens abruptly. Something's already in the heart. And that's why it's important that we separate ourselves from the world and the thinking of this world. And, and, and devote our time and our thoughts to the Word of God. Because in the end, we're going to be judged on God's Word, not on what the world thinks. Do you think that God cares what all these people think about gender studies? Right? And how right they think they are and how righteous they think they are? I could care less. What's more important is what the Word of God says. There has got to be a foundation for righteousness. And it's not found in the thinking of this world. It's found in the Word of God. And that's where our focus must be. And sometimes, like I say, we have to separate ourselves from those in the world. Or even worse off than those in the world is those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Thinking that, oh, they, they have this form like they are good, but inwardly, they, they, their hearts are far from Him. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers. And he goes on to list all these. The gr corruption is the greatest enemy of the church. Corruption is the greatest enemy of the church. I remember reading about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and, uh, who was uh, a pastor and theologian during the time of Hitler. And like I mentioned him before, and how he died in a concentration camp. Uh, but but in his writings, it come to you know that that here Hitler, there were many people who, around Hitler, advisors to Hitler, who wanted to shut down the churches because they wanted to control the people. But Hitler was smart. He knew that a corrupted church was more useful to him, more useful to him than trying to shut down the church. He seen it as a tool, and so does Satan. 
Because any time you ever go to talk to somebody about the Lord, what's the first thing they usually say? They start telling you a story about some hypocrite somewhere. And I try to deflect from that because, listen, my job isn't to defend a hypocrite. <laughs> right? That, that's not my job as a minister of the gospel. I'll acknowledge the fact that there are hypocrites. There are churches who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. There are churches who Jesus Christ is not Lord. Because the faults love to come in. And that's where the true church needs to stand up. I would much rather preach to a handful of people than a stadium full of people going to hell. Although I would love that opportunity because I let them know about it. Amen? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. The way to combat corruption is the cross. It is the cross. Drawing closer to the Lord and moving away from the world and this worldly system, and that's what we must do. Like I said, it is an active process, not a passive one. You have to take action. Some people may call you self-righteous. Some people may say whatever. I don't care what they think about me. What I do care about is honoring my Father. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Again, I thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that you would open up our eyes that we might see the devices of the devil. Let us not be like those those qualities described today. Father, help us, Lord, to... to Walk upright and righteously before you. Help us to clean not just the outside, but the inward as well. I thank you, Lord, for that in Jesus' name.